Thank you for joining me as I conclude my examination of the works of Amy or Ewing with this, the final video in this series. We will be covering chapters 9 and 10 of book two of our series, which is Amy or Ewing's Is Believing in God Irrational? So let's get started with chapter nine. I used to believe, but I've given it all up. Or Ewing opens by describing a meeting that she had with a group of Christian women, most of whom claimed to have children or grandchildren who had left the faith after they grew up. Why do people turn away from the church? Or Ewing says that she will address some of the most commonly cited reasons in this chapter. First, there are those who say they distanced themselves from Christianity because they outgrew it. Or Ewing acknowledges that this is a very popular reason that many adults who were raised in a Christian household now look back at their former religion with something like nostalgia, but also as something that they feel that they're too sophisticated now to really genuinely believe in. But Or Ewing argues that it shouldn't matter whether you were introduced to Christianity as a child or not. She says, quote, the crucial question to be faced here is whether the Christian worldview merits serious investigation. Whether I went to church as a child or not, does Christianity make sense? And more importantly, is it actually true? Here we go again. That doesn't matter. What matters is whether or not Christianity is true. Right. I've said several times throughout this series, we agree that is the most important question of Christianity. That is the most important question that should be answered by defenders of Christianity, also known as apologists. Is Christianity true? And if your argument is, yes, it is true, and therefore it merits serious consideration, then why is it true? Why? Why is it true? You hear that? that? That is a car outside, if you can make that out, but it is also the sound of Amy or Ewing's answer to that most important of questions. There is no answer to that question, at least not that we have been offered in this book to this point. And it's getting pretty late for the argument or the answer to that question to suddenly pop up in a satisfying form. Maybe instead of saying that people are arguing about the wrong thing, or Ewing should ask herself why so many people who were raised Christians choose to walk away from it when they grow up and are able to make their own decisions. And again, it's still not a massive number of people, but the number gets larger and larger every time there's a head count. Every time there's a survey, the group that no longer identifies as any particular religion gets larger and larger, becomes a greater percentage of the overall population. And maybe Amy Oering should ask herself why so many people who are raised Christian, for example, feel completely justified in walking away from it later in life. After all, if what Or Ewing says is true and Christianity is a reasonable and factually based belief system, and there are numerous examples of persuasive arguments and compelling evidence that substantiate the factual truth of Christianity that people could consult when they begin to have doubts, why would anyone outgrow it? Wouldn't people leaving Christianity be relatively rare as opposed to a minority, but a nonetheless large and growing number of people? So why do people walk away? Well, maybe it's because the good arguments and the solid evidence that Or Ewing often generally references, but never specifically identifies, don't actually exist. Until I see evidence to the contrary, that will be my assumption. Another reason why people leave Christianity, or Ewing says, is that they just don't think it's true anymore, which is a good reason. Gets right to the heart of what Amy or Ewing says is the most important issue here. Or Ewing recalls a debate she had on the radio with someone who had become an atheist after being a Christian for many years. Or Ewing reflects that her atheist debate opponent seemed reluctant to scrutinize his atheism in the same way he had scrutinized his Christianity prior to walking away from it. After all, atheists have presuppositions underlying our worldview, just the same as Christians do. She writes, quote, the presuppositions of secularism 
that there is no God, miracles do not happen, and man is the measure of all things, need to be challenged and questioned as rigorously as the Christian presuppositions that the God who created the world and made humanity in his image is a personal being who reveals himself. Which presuppositions most adequately account for the universe, reason, personhood, and all that we see and experience? Well, here's the problem. Or Ewing seems to want atheists to start from zero and re-examine all their presuppositions constantly. And if they don't do that, then they aren't being fair when they ask that Christians do the same. A presupposition is something that you assume to be true when you make a statement or begin a new line of argument. Calling it a presupposition doesn't mean that there's no evidence to support it. It doesn't mean that you believe it to be true for no reason. It just means that you assume that it's true as a starting point for your reasoning. She's right that all presuppositions are not created equal. Not all presuppositions are equally reasonable. It's perfectly fair to ask someone who holds to a worldview you consider unreasonable to consider whether or not the presuppositions at the foundation of that worldview are valid. But keep in mind that they may have already done that they may be very aware of what their presuppositions are, and they may have very good reasons for believing those presuppositions are reasonable. It's a little misleading for Or Ewing to present the secular presuppositions, no God, no miracles, and the Christian presuppositions that God created everything and made humanity in his image as equivalent to one another. If you want to base a worldview on the assumptions that God created the universe and made us in his image, you still need some evidence that those things are true. Even if you come up with a theory built on those presuppositions that perfectly accounts for the universe and our experiences in it, you still need evidence to substantiate those premises or the theory is useless. Because if, if you're willing to create a theory that is totally untethered to reality as we know it, you can come up with a theory that perfectly describes everything that works in every single instance, that has no problems, that has no inconsistencies, that has no questions it cannot answer, you can create the perfect theory. If you don't worry about whether or not it actually corresponds to reality or has any evidence to suggest that this is really the way things are, it's a lot more difficult when you tether yourself to reality, when you say, we're not just going to try to explain everything in a perfect model, but we're going to root that model in our empirical observations, and we're only going to make true statements that we have reason to believe are true, that are backed up with solid evidence and reasoning. When you, when you, when you ground yourself that way, it seriously limits your options but it also makes it much more likely that the theory you come up with will be reflective and representative, at least in some measure, of the reality that you are attempting to explain. The presuppositions that Or Ewing says lie at the foundation of secularism are based on the lack of evidence for the opposite positions. If there is no reason to believe that God exists or that miracles occur, and there are no reasons to believe in either of those things, of which I am aware, then it's reasonable to assume that God doesn't exist and that miracles don't occur and to try to make sense of the world accordingly. Now, if evidence that God exists or that miracles do occur surfaces, then obviously you need to be open-minded enough to evaluate that evidence and to alter your theory accordingly. You shouldn't be completely closed off to the possibility, even hypothetically, if evidence does turn up at some future date that suggests very strongly, very persuasively that there is a God or there is such a thing as a miracle that can't be explained by known science, then you have to be willing to incorporate that. You have to be willing to accept that. But in the absence of such evidence, it's only reasonable to ignore claims which would have to be substantiated by that evidence. Or Ewing says that the first thing to establish is whether the Christian worldview accurately describes reality, accounts for the human condition, and gives us insight into the origin and purpose of the universe. How do we establish these things? Or Ewing's answer is to read the Bible. That's the first thing she says when she responds to how do you test the Christian worldview? How do you determine if this is a reasonable way to look at the world? She says, read the Bible. But how do you test whether or not the Bible is true? 
she leaves that step out. The Bible is the basis, largely, for the Christian worldview, but the Bible is not what we need to look at in order to determine whether or not the premises on which that worldview is built are true, as in corresponding to reality. You don't test the Christian worldview against the Bible, not if you're interested in discovering if it's based on factual truths. If you want to test whether or not a, a given Christian worldview is consistent with a given reading of the Bible, yeah, absolutely, test it against the Bible. But if you want to find out whether or not it represents reality, you don't test it against the Bible. You test the truth claims of the worldview that are derived from the Bible upon which the worldview stands against reality. In other words, you need evidence external from the Bible. Or Ewing knows that you need evidence, but she believes that the evidence should play a secondary role to the Bible. She writes, quote, once we have examined competing presuppositions, I believe there is a subsequent role for examining evidence in discerning truth. I do not use the word proof here because it carries connotations of repeatable scientific experiments which cannot be produced to support naturalistic assumptions or Christian statements. What? Naturalistic assumptions can't be substantiated via scientific experiments? What is she talking about? There are many Christian statements, and statements made by all religions, to be fair, that can't be scientifically verified because they are structured so as to be unfalsifiable. But what naturalist assumptions are unfalsifiable? What widely accepted naturalist claims have, have not been empirically verified? What popular, hotly argued, naturalist scientific theories are unfalsifiable? Some people might say that certain forms of string theory are unfalsifiable, and that is uh, a, a, an area where there's still a lot of debate and argument. But generally speaking, a good scientific theory, even if it hasn't yet been uh, substantiated by empirical evidence and experimentation. It's still considered a potentially viable theory as long as it is unfalsifiable in principle, as long as scientists know, okay, how do we try to prove this wrong? As long as it's falsifiable, you've got, you've got a leg to stand on scientifically until it has been falsified to the satisfaction of the scientific community. And then they say, okay, this probably isn't true, let's move on. But it has to be falsifiable in principle, or generally speaking, it's not considered science. It's terrible science that is unfalsifiable because science operates on falsifiability. That's how it moves forward. That's how it determines what isn't true. This is an attempt to frame the rejection of Christianity as no less of a faith position than the acceptance of Christianity. Again, well-worn apologist tactics here. Everything is religion. Everything is faith-based. Science is faith-based, just like Christianity. If you don't believe in miracles because there's no evidence for them, you have exactly the same kind of faith as a Christian who does believe in miracles despite there being no evidence for them. That is the argument that is being made here. There is historical evidence for Christianity, though, or Ewing tells us. Evidence that can be examined by modern skeptics. That evidence is that which is related to what? Anyone? Shout it out. The resurrection of Jesus. I know some of you got it. I know some of you got it. Here's the evidence related to the resurrection according to Amy or Ewing. Pay attention. Jesus really died on the cross. Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The disciples were discouraged after his death. Women who were considered unreliable witnesses legally at the time were the first people to report that the tomb was empty. There is no competing burial tradition for Jesus other than the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and resurrection story. The early church based its message on the resurrection. The disciples were transformed and risked their lives to proclaim the resurrection. The resurrected Christ appeared to hundreds of people as well as to a skeptic, Thomas, and an enemy of the church at the time, Saul, who became Paul. And the disciples had no precedent to call upon for their belief that Jesus was bodily resurrected, and therefore they must have believed it because it actually happened. What do you notice about that list of things? None of those things qualifies as evidence. 
you can't respond to what's the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus with, well, he really died on the cross and he really came back. That's not evidence. That's an unsubstantiated claim. All of the things I just read that Or Ewing calls issues to be considered and declares as though they are true, undisputed facts, are in fact completely unsubstantiated claims. She then goes through the possibilities that might account for this so-called evidence. And again, this will sound very familiar to anyone who has ever watched one of my videos where we talk about the evidence for the resurrection from a Christian perspective or heard any Christian evangelist or apologist discuss this issue at length for any amount of, of time, for any, no matter how many times you've heard it. It's, well, maybe the disciples were hallucinating or they were deceived or maybe the disciples themselves were the ones who were deceptive and they stole the body of Jesus and invented the resurrection story. Maybe Jesus didn't actually die on the cross and simply woke up and just walked out of his tomb. And then, of course, there is the only possibility that could possibly be true according to Amy or Ewing and most other Christians and Christian apologists, and that is that God actually did raise Jesus from the dead, which or Ewing proclaims to be the most plausible explanation. She gives this list of facts as though they are undisputed facts, and then she says the best explanation for this is that the story is true and Jesus truly was resurrected by God. Never mind that the whole list of things that she's trying to account for with these various competing explanations of the stolen body or the hallucination, we can't even say that they're facts. We can't even get to how do we account for these facts because we haven't yet even established that they are facts. But she skips that part. She lists them with confidence as though, okay, everybody accepts that these things actually happened. And then she says, now how do we account for them? Oh, gee, I think the best explanation is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Or Ewing calls the resurrection of Jesus a historical event that can fundamentally shift our thinking and provide the foundation of a worldview that will comprehensively reshape our reasoning. If it happened, which we have no reason to believe, I'm sorry, but simply itemizing the details of the resurrection story found in the New Testament is not the same thing as empirically substantiating that those events actually happened. There are many areas of Christianity that are built, as I said before, on unfalsifiable claims. But the resurrection of Jesus, in my opinion, at least for the most part, is not one of them. Jesus died and returned from the dead is a claim that should be empirically testable. But it's such an extraordinary claim and would be so unprecedented in human history if it happened that it's unreasonable to assume it did happen without very compelling evidence. What Or Ewing and other Christian apologists want is for people to assume that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened as depicted in the Gospels until someone can prove conclusively that it didn't happen. In other words, they want to shift the burden of proof and demand that non-Christians who doubt the historicity of the resurrection actually try to prove a negative. They make an extraordinary and utterly unsubstantiated claim. Then they declare that it must be true because no one has proven that it isn't true to their satisfaction, completely ignoring the fact that they can't prove it's true in the first place. Well, there's some more evidence for the truth of Christianity beyond the resurrection. Amy Or Ewing writes, quote, The how can I know question can also be answered by a personal encounter with God. In an earlier chapter, we examined the idea of a religious delusion, but here the important point is that if God is real and Christianity is true, we can know and experience this for ourselves. The promise of the Bible is here and can be tested if we ask Jesus to enter our lives and hearts. He will make himself known to us. That's not what everyone says. She makes this statement as though it's universally true. If you ask Jesus to enter your heart, he will make himself known, as though it's this, this uh, surefire cause and effect relationship. It's a fact. It just what, it's just what happens. But how many people watching this video have heard that? How many people have done just that? Earnestly asked Jesus to show himself, only to be met with nothing, as a response. I'm willing to bet more than one of you has had that experience at some point in your life. 
Now we're back into unfalsifiable territory. If you ask Jesus into your heart and you soon after find yourself a believer, that's evidence that Jesus is real and that the promises made in the Bible are true. If you ask Jesus into your heart and nothing happens, well, that must be because you weren't being sincere. Or maybe Jesus did reach out to you, but you were just too cynical to accept what was happening. Is there anything that can happen after you ask Jesus into your heart that might hypothetically suggest Christianity isn't true and Jesus isn't actually there? Apparently not. Or Ewing writes that some people have no rational reason to disbelieve. They just drift away. Maybe they wouldn't drift away if they had rational reasons to believe in the first place. Maybe not having any rational reasons to believe is a rational reason to disbelieve. She then returns to the subject for some reason of Christianity and sex, describing how some people leave the church because they can't accept Christian attitudes towards sex. And this is too bad, she says, because it leads some people to engage in irresponsible sexual behavior that can have serious consequences in their lives. But luckily, Jesus is such a stand-up, forgiving guy. Their sexual sins can be forgiven, and their relationship with God can always be restored. Well, I hate to repeat myself yet again, but maybe people would be more willing to live according to the sexual ethics of their church if they had some compelling evidence and persuasive arguments that they could point to establishing that Christianity was true. If you're a young person and you're just developing sexually, you're discovering this whole new part of yourself that's going to be an important part of your life for the rest of your life, and you're told that sex is bad, that if you have sex outside of marriage, particularly, you're committing a terrible sin, and if you're a girl, you're told that it'll make you a whore, then, and you're told that the way you feel is wrong, that, the, that you feel this way because you're being tempted by evil, but on the other side, there's no reason to believe any of those rules come from a legitimate authority or that any of this is true. Shit, why wouldn't you decide, you know what, the hell with this, I'm gonna fuck my girlfriend or my boyfriend, or my them friend, or whoever. Why wouldn't you make that decision as, as a, a teenager or a young adult going through this, this process of, of sexual awakening? Why wouldn't you look at your church that apparently, philosophically, logically, evidentially, has no leg to stand on, there's no reason they can give you why you should listen to them, why you should treat them as any kind of an authority, particularly over how you conduct your private life. Why wouldn't you look at them and say, you know what the hell with you? I'm going to do what I want to do. And it does, it's not because you're a little hedonist or you're a selfish little pervert and all, all you want to do is, is give in to your sinful lusts. It's because you have decided that that church over there that is trying to tell you what to do has no authority from which to tell you what to do. Now, obviously, there is such a thing as irresponsible sexual behavior, especially for young people who are still figuring a lot of this shit out. Obviously, there can be major consequences as a result of unprotected sex or reckless sexual activity in general, but none of those consequences are the result of sex being sinful or of sex outside of marriage being against God's rules. If Or Ewing wants young Christians to live by and appreciate the Christian view of sex, she needs to show up with some evidence that Christianity is true and that Christian leaders, that, that pastors and, and Christian parents and the God of Christianity and Jesus have some right to make those rules. If they can't do that, then I really don't see how they can blame the kids for saying, ah, oh, no, sorry. Not going to do it that way. Well, Or Ewing ends this chapter by returning to the problem of people who walk away from Christianity. She says, quote, The crucial questions to settle then are, on what grounds have I rejected Christianity? Are these grounds substantial or circumstantial? Shouldn't I examine my presuppositions as well as the evidence for Christ before rejecting something so important out of hand? Something tells me most people who walk away from Christianity, especially those who were very committed to it at one point in their lives, have already grappled with those questions. By the same token, 
shouldn't Christians examine the grounds on which they have accepted Christianity, especially when they are reaching out beyond their personal faith and trying to convince others to believe as they believe. Chapter 10, how can I know? Last chapter, is Christianity all in your mind? That's the question with which Oryuing opens this final chapter of the book. She writes that she's heard from friends over the years that they are happy that Christianity seems to agree with her, but it's just not for them. And she laments how religious faith is often seen as a figment of the mind, that it can be good for you if it makes you happy, but it's not objectively real, and therefore it isn't relevant beyond you as an individual. But if what you believe is only in your mind, doesn't that make it an illusion, she says? And then from here, she goes off on an irrelevant tangent about Eastern philosophy and how even people who believe that all life is an illusion still make decisions as though it were real. Therefore, that philosophy is untenable. Plus, if you assume life is an illusion, you must also assume that there is such a thing as reality somewhere. Otherwise, how could you define what an illusion was? But if you do that, you affirm the existence of the thing you're trying to deny, namely reality. A couple of observations here. First, if someone believes that religious faith is all in your mind and doesn't refer to anything real, that doesn't mean that they must also think that everything anyone believes is an illusion. Sometimes when you tell a religious person, I'm glad that works for you, but it doesn't work for me, that's a polite way of telling them that you don't think their religion is true. And sometimes it's a polite way of saying to them, I don't want to hear about your goddamn religion. Let's talk about something else. And sometimes it does mean your religion is an illusion of your mind, but it doesn't follow from that that everything you believe is an illusion. Nor would it follow that there was no such thing as reality if you did believe that everything we experience is an illusion. Saying our lives are an illusion isn't a denial of all possible reality. It's a denial of the reality of what we experience. But these are two more examples of the kinds of misdirections and stealth changes of subject that Oryuing has attempted throughout this book and the previous book in this series and that apologists depend upon generally. Anyway, because she's almost made it through the entire book without slogging through a half-assed, biased-as-hell attempt to refute a major Western philosopher, the next section of the chapter is about whether or not we can truly know anything. She compares the Christian worldview to Immanuel Kant's notion that we never see the world itself, only our perception of it. Since the world really does exist beyond our perceptions of it, the Christian worldview is more reasonable, she says, because it proposes a real God who created a real world. All of which could be an illusion. And there's no way you can possibly prove otherwise to a 100% certainty. Kant merely points out what ought to be, in my opinion, treated as an inarguable fact of our existence. Everything we know about the world beyond our minds, we learn through our senses which are interpreted by our brains. That doesn't mean a real world definitely doesn't exist. That doesn't mean the nature of reality itself, whatever it is, is determined by our minds. It means that what we perceive and experience as reality is not reality itself, but a model of reality, or what we presume to be reality, a product of our senses and our brains. Now, we trust that the perception of reality that we have is basically accurate, that our senses are reliable, and that the world that exists outside of our minds is more or less what we experience it to be. But if it wasn't, if everything we perceive and experience were some kind of simulation, there's really no way of knowing for sure. That being the case, it only makes sense to treat our perceptions and experiences as real and to live accordingly. There is no compelling reason to assume generally that our experiences are illusions or that the world is not as we perceive it to be. But there is that inescapable possibility, that philosophical problem that cannot be solved. 
regardless of the nature of reality. We are all trapped inside our minds, completely dependent on our senses and our brain's ability to interpret the information gathered by those senses. And one consequence of that is the possibility, though we may not take it seriously, that everything in the universe as we know it, that is, as we perceive it and experience it, could be false, could be illusory, could be simulated. And that includes Oryuing's real God. Because even if he is real, God must first be perceived, or as Oryuing has said several times, experienced, before we can know that he's there. She can say, but God is real, God is real, God is really, really real, as much as she wants, and she can believe that. But she can't avoid the fact that she only believes he is real because of things she has experienced, and those experiences are dependent on her senses and her brain. And that means there will always be the possibility that none of it is real, that no matter how powerful she imagines her God to be, she is simply, honestly, mistaken about his existence. Now, what was I just saying about knowing God by experiencing him? Quote, this is where we really come down to the radical claim of Jesus, that you and I can know God. We can call him Father, and we can know his presence through the Holy Spirit, who Jesus promised would come to us. We can experience him in the depths of our heart. This is the claim of the Christian faith. You can know God, and you can know in your deepest heart of hearts that you know him. Well, from there, she writes about how her husband came to Christianity. As a child, he experienced Christianity from the outside, imagining that being a member of the clergy must have been a, a terrible job. But one day, while he was pondering the implications of Jesus having truly returned from his death on the cross, he saw a vision of Jesus sitting on a throne, and he had a feeling that he knew Jesus loved him. He felt as though he had actually met God, and that changed his whole life. It changed his whole perception of Christianity. And, and I hate to sound like Or Ewing's anonymous friends reference at the start of the chapter, but here we go. That's nice for him. But surely, one has to acknowledge that it's possible to have such an experience without the deity encountered in the vision actually existing. It's a blatant double standard to assume that, for instance, Muslims who have similar visions are hallucinating or dreaming, while Christians are experiencing the real thing. But of course, it's that very double standard upon which apologists who make the you have to experience God for yourself argument depend. People in other religions who experience dreams or visions, who report simply knowing internally that God exists or that God loves them, well, they're just misguided somehow or mistaken. But when Christians report the same things about Jesus, well, that's because the Holy Spirit is reaching out to them as Jesus promised it would. And now we come to the end, as Or Ewing shares with us one final encounter with God, as described by Blaise Pascal. Yes, he of Pascal's wager, thankfully in what must have been an act of Herculean restraint for a Christian apologist, she does not even mention Pascal's wager. Instead, she quotes Pascal, who wrote once a description of a very vivid and powerful two-hour vision of God that he experienced. There was fire. There was God himself. There were these feelings of certainty and joy and a desire to be with God and never be separated from God and a conviction that God could only be known through the gospel and a feeling of wanting to have total submission to Jesus. And then she closes the book with this, quote, not every Christian has such a dramatic experience of God as Pascal, although many do, but the offer to all is the possibility of knowing God in a relationship in addition to knowing something about him. This is the ultimate way of finding out the answer to the question, but is it real? Encountering God for yourself. You know, it strikes me how little Or Ewing attempts in this book to engage with the question that serves as its title. Is believing in God irrational? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. 
but you wouldn't have any idea after reading this book. Most of it doesn't even attempt to make a case for why believing in God is rational. There are repeated declarations that what really matters is whether or not God exists, but only the most vague allusions to what the evidence that substantiates God's existence might be. There's the listing of assumed facts about the resurrection of Jesus, facts for which, in most cases, there is no single source other than the New Testament, as though this constitutes evidence for anything. But ultimately, the whole book comes down to this. Well, just ask Jesus into your heart. Ask God to reveal himself to you, and he will. Note that none of the great leaders of the faith we read about in the Bible, with the exception of Paul, had to base their faith on such illusory and easy-to-dismiss evidence as personal visions or dreams or these very esoteric experiences of God. In the Old Testament, God was very active and sometimes even personally present. He spoke to people audibly. He sent angels. He responded to the cries of his prophets with action. In the New Testament, he incarnated as Jesus in the flesh. He worked miracles. He calmed stormy seas. He raised the dead back to life. He returned to life himself after his own death and appeared to people who saw him and touched him. Why is it that God is only willing to provide his followers with tangible evidence of his existence in the distant past, unavailable to those of us alive today, hell, those of us who have lived any time in the last two millennia, with the exception of the first few decades of the first century. God has the power to reveal himself to everyone in such a way so as to make his existence undeniable. He could convince every single person that he was real and that the Bible was his book and that the Bible should only be interpreted in a particular way, if he wanted to, but he doesn't. Apologists say he doesn't do this because it would take away free will, because apparently to convince someone that something is true is to rob them of their free will, but I'll leave that aside. The thing is, he was willing to provide people with the kind of evidence that critics of Christianity are demanding in the past if we are to believe the Bible. He was willing, according to the Bible, to show up in person or to speak directly to people or to send credible representatives or to work miracles in order to prove to people that he was real and that he was who he said he was. In fact, many apologists say that the age of miracles was in order to provide evidence to people, that Jesus worked miracles for his disciples to prove that he was who he said he was, to prove that his message of, of him being the Son of God and, and, and salvation and forgiveness was true. So if God is in the practice of proving himself with evidence, with persuasive demonstrations, why is it that he only did that, as far as we know, most recently, according to the Bible, according to most Christians, 2,000 years ago? The free will argument didn't seem to bother him then. Nowhere in the Gospels do we read of one of the apostles asking Jesus for proof that he was the Son of God, only to have Jesus reply, if I gave you proof, I'd be robbing you of your ability to make choices, and then you couldn't truly love me. So, sorry, you're just going to have to take it on faith. Sorry, I'm, I, I can't raise this person from the dead. I can't turn this water into wine. I mean, trust me, I could do it, but I'm not going to. I need you to believe it without actually seeing me do it. That's just the way it works. Or Ewing is correct when she says that if God exists, believing in God is not irrational. But the qualification you must add to that line of reasoning is this. There has to be a way to get to that state of belief other than unsubstantiated claims and wishful thinking. If God exists, and if there are good reasons, solid evidence, and compelling arguments that point us unavoidably toward the fact of his existence, then of course, believing in God is very rational. The question then becomes, are there such reasons and is there such evidence? And so far, the answer seems to be no. 
despite the insistence of apologists to the contrary. There are two questions that dominate this uninflated balloon of a book. The first is the one in the title, Is Believing in God Irrational? The second is the one which Amy Or Ewing tells us over and over again is the most important question, Does God Exist? It's suggestive to me that she makes no serious attempt to directly answer either one. Well, that's it for chapter 10. That's it for that book. That's it for this series. I am going to follow my usual custom of taking a two-week break. For those of you who are watching these as I upload them, I'm going to make some Stephen Stuffy videos to upload in this Thursday slot on my upload schedule. And then I will return for a fourth book for this year. I will be doing one more Atheist Read series that will then wrap up around September. And the next book in the series which will begin after my upcoming two-week Stephen Stuffy break, uh, will be the book Keeping Your Kids on God's Side by Natasha Crane. It is a Christian parenting guide, which is a first for me. And it will also be my fourth and final book this year, uh, written by a woman Christian apologist, um, which was my, my stated intentional goal this year to focus on women who write apologetics because they are largely overlooked, mainly because there really aren't that many. Uh, so this will be my final book starting the next series, Keeping Your Kids on God's Side. So if you are someone who likes to read along with me, uh, get yourself a used copy or a Kindle copy. I will be using my Kindle copy as, as has been my custom over the last few years. Um, so there you go. That'll be the next series. Thank you all so, so much for watching this series. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope that you got something out of it, that you found it entertaining or informative or, or something. I, feel, I hope that you have a feeling at the end of this that you're glad you watched it. And of course, if you have any response to anything I've had to say, please, please, please leave a comment on this video. Tell me if I got something right or if I got something wrong. Argue with me about something I had to say in this. Respond in uh, any way that you feel is warranted by what I've said in this video, whether you are a fellow atheist or a Christian or some other point on the spectrum of belief or non-belief. I look forward to hearing what you have had to say about what I have had to say. And also, if you enjoy these Atheist Reads videos of mine, and if you enjoy my work in general, please consider helping me to do more of this by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron of this channel for as little as $1 a month. And if you can afford to pledge $5 a month or more, you can take advantage of some really cool perks that I offer, including at the $5 per month level, you can get a peek at the scripts for an Atheist Reads videos. And I put the scripts up the day before the videos go live on YouTube. So you get a little sneak peek of the Atheist Reads series. And, and I, I post scripts for other scripted videos that I do as well. I post the screenplays for the Stephen Stuffy videos and, and for assorted other videos that I take the time to script. So that's just a, a one extra little perk if you're interested and if you can afford it, if you think I'm worth it. Uh, thank you to all of you for your Patreon support at whatever level you are currently pledging. Thanks to all of you for watching this series. And I will see you next time.